Good morning and welcome to Jamestown United Methodist Church. I'm David Green, one of the pastors here, and I am so glad that you have chosen to join us today on this third Sunday of Advent as we journey together looking at Christmas in the four gospel homes. The purpose of our journey is to experience what Christmas means from the perspective of each gospel, how Christmas is celebrated there. This morning, we immerse ourselves in the Gospel of Luke as we discover the way the good news is presented. Gathered here, we declare our intention to live as if the greatest gift in the world were about to be placed in our hands and as if the giver has understood our deepest needs, our most heartfelt prayers. There is a presence in our world that asks to be seen. There is a coming in our world that seeks a welcome even now, Jesus Christ is moving toward us.
come and rejoice in God. Sing praise to God who continually blesses our lives. In the midst of trouble and stress, God is near, offering compassion. Our hope is in the Lord. Let all the people praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God in the highest, and hope to every discouraged heart. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to every conflicted soul. Glory to God in the highest, and joy to every downcast spirit. Glory to God in the highest, and love to everyone. Let us sing praises to our God. Let us offer this light against the darkness. As we light this Advent candle, we remember that God gives the gift of new life, peace to a broken world. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you were born among us into a human family. You took up residence in our world. And that's one reason why we can come to you in prayer, because you took an interest in us, because you came close to us. We know that you care about us. You stooped to us and reached out to us so that we can reach out to you. We are bold to pray for the needs of those in this congregation and for the needs of those in the whole world. We lift up those especially who are dealing with illness, those who are suffering at the hands of cruel governments. All of this we lift to your throne. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the one who comes to us in the nativity, the one whom we now await in hope. And we pray the prayer he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We thank you for all your generous gifts here at Jamestown, for the ways that you give of your time and of your money. And we pray that you would continue to give in this season of giving. Let us pray. God who gives us all gifts, in this season we focus so much on giving gifts to one another. Help us to remember what John the Baptist tells us is on your wish list, that we might bear fruit worthy of repentance, fruit of compassion, fruit of sharing, fruit by denying ourselves so that others who have little will have enough. In response to you, we give that our fruit might please you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here be Our scripture reading this morning is from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. Hear these words. About that time, Caesar Augustus ordered a census to be taken throughout the empire. This was the first census when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone had to travel to his own ancestral town, hometown to be accounted for. So Joseph went from the Galilean town of Nazareth up to Bethlehem in Judah, David's town, for the census. As a descendant of David, he had to go there. He went with Mary, his fiancée, who was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. She gave birth to a son, her firstborn. She wrapped him in a blanket and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the hostel. There were shepherds camping in the neighborhood. They had set night watches over their sheep. 
Suddenly, God's angel stood among them, and God's glory blazed around them. They were terrified. The angel said, Don't be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. A Savior has just been born in David's town, a Savior who is Messiah and Master. This is what you're to look for. A baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a manger. At once, the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir singing God's praises. Glory to God in the heavenly heights. Peace to all men and women on earth who please him. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The traditional nativity play and live nativity scenes are a sure sign the festive season is in full swing. But these productions are a nest of potential disasters waiting to happen. And with a quick Google search, you can keep yourself busy for hours going down the rabbit hole of pooping donkeys, misread lines, and stolen baby Jesuses. Even still, they are a great gift to the community and a gentle reminder that Jesus is the reason for the season. The reason we even have nativity scenes is largely because of St. Francis of Assisi. Francis was concerned that the feast of Christmas was mainly focused on gifts and parties. He wanted Christians to remember that the feast of Christmas is really about Jesus' birth. So he created the now famous scene that is on display in most churches. The first nativity scenes were live and outdoors, and over the years, nativity scenes have come to be fashioned out of wood and clay, Coke cans, dogs, cats, and even pasta noodles like the one I made as a child. Some are simple and some are quite elaborate. This was a way to make the story of Christmas come alive as a focus for devotion and prayer. And it is Luke's gospel that gives us the foundation for the story we now see displayed in crushes all over the world. Luke's gospel gives us the Christmas story we know best and love the most. The setting is a place of warmth and safety, despite there being no room for them in the end. Angels fill the night sky with wondrous music. Shepherds abide in the fields, keeping watch over those flocks by night. And Mary ponders everything in her heart. Christmas at Luke's house is just what we all want the most. Beauty and joy and peace. As we visit Luke's house, Kevin Burns portrays it as an open and welcoming ranch house. Kids playing in the yard with an assortment of animals, a full porch, inviting visitors to stop by for just a moment. Everything about Luke's house is screaming, welcome! During Christmas, Luke's house is decorated with an inch of its life. Think Griswold House in National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Christmas carols coming from a loudspeaker on the roof. It is a joyous place and open to all. While its Christmas spirit and decorations are certainly over the top, there is more going on at Luke's house than initially meets the eye. With each of our gospel house visits, we've been asking, Where does the good news begin? With Mark, it begins with John the Baptist, the herald or messenger who prepares the way for the Messiah. Matthew begins with Abraham, to whom God promised a channel of blessing for all. Luke, too, gives a backstory to Jesus' ministry. He doesn't just speak about the birth. He spends quite a bit of time on what came before the birth in chapter 1. N.T. Wright, a scholar and theologian, calls it the gospel before the gospel. With Luke, we journey through the familiar sights and sounds of Christmas, and then we're invited to go deeper into the house and deeper into the story. Here, the good news, again, doesn't actually begin with Jesus. It doesn't begin with John the Baptist. It begins with his parents, Zachariah and Elizabeth. Now, at this point in their lives, Zachariah and Elizabeth were, by all intents and purposes, old. No matter how fulfilling their lives were, they still were without children. And the worldview at that time labeled Elizabeth 
as barren. Being childless meant that there would be no one to care for them in their old age, no one to carry on a legacy or a name. Then one day, as the story goes, Zechariah was at the temple, and an angel appeared to him and told him that at long last he and Elizabeth would have a child. They were to be parents, like Abraham and Sarah, when life had seemed over. God was once again bringing forth new life. To those who had no hope, God gave the gift of a future. Luke here is crafting a gospel before the gospel. It is intricate and powerful. And in the first chapter of Luke's gospel, there are two appearances by the angel Gabriel to Zachariah and Mary. These two characters are contrast to one another. One is an old man, the other a young girl, one a priest in the Jerusalem temple, the other a peasant girl from a small town. He protests the news of the angel asking for proof, and she, she receives the news with courageous grace. Zachariah is made speechless nine months to be exact so that he can truly understand what is going on. And Mary immediately journeys to her cousin Elizabeth's house and sings the most amazing song. And it is in Luke's gospel that within these two amazing songs sung by these two people, that we discover the first good news. Hear first Mary's song. With all my heart I glorify the Lord. In the depths of who I am, I rejoice in God my Savior. He has looked with favor on the low status of his servant. Look, from now on, everyone will consider me highly favored because the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. He shows mercy to everyone from one generation to the next who honors him as God. He has scattered those with arrogant thoughts and proud inclinations. He has pulled down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly, fulfilled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty handed. He has come to the aid of his servant Israel, remembering his mercy, just as he promised to our ancestors, to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants forever. This song by Mary is beautiful and yet radical all at the same time because she is singing about the future in past tense. Because here, with eyes of faith, God's victory has already happened. It is in her song that we find what God is going to do in the world and to the world. The world has been turned upside down. She says, power no longer resides with the rich, Food, which is life, sustenance, is available to the hungry or poor. And those with enough, well, they aren't getting any more. Zechariah's song is similar. Bless the Lord God of Israel because he has come to help and has delivered his people. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in his servant David's house, just as he said through the mouths of his holy prophets long ago. He has brought salvation from our enemies and from the power of all those who hate us. He has shown mercy to our ancestors and remembered his holy covenant, the solemn pledge he made to our ancestor Abraham. He has granted that we would be rescued from the power of our enemies so that we could serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness in God's eyes for as long as we live. Because of our God's deep compassion, the dawn from heaven will break upon us to give light to those who are sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide us on the path of peace. Zechariah's song echoes of God's redemption for God's people, giving them freedom to worship God without fear. Zechariah sings about John's ministry. John is the one to come to prepare the way for the Messiah, the one who will bring light into the darkness and guide people to peace. These songs of Mary and Zechariah set the entire tone for the Gospel of Luke. Fast forwarding to chapter 4, we see that Jesus' ministry begins in Nazareth with the announcement that he has come to preach good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and liberty to the oppressed. 
Jesus says more about money, poverty, and caring for the poor in Luke than any other gospel. Luke makes it very clear that God's reign is present through the words and actions of Jesus. The parables we find in Luke celebrate the lost and reuniting the estranged. Sinners are welcomed into Jesus' company. Women are a part of Jesus' followers and are friends of Jesus. Gentiles, too, find themselves centered in the narrative. Jesus came to enlighten Gentiles and to be a light for God's people of Israel. For Luke, Mary and Zechariah, all of this, everything that is combined here in how the gospel is presented is a sign that God has not forgotten God's people or the promises that God made long ago. God remembers those promises, specifically the one made to Abraham and Sarah, that there would be a future. A future of blessing for the whole human family. They were ordinary people, Mary, Zechariah, Luke, Abraham, Sarah. Living in the midst of the unknown and uncertainty and desperation of their lives. You and me, we are all ordinary people, and ordinary people live with disappointments. Ordinary people pray that God will intervene and change their circumstances. Ordinary people get tired of praying and give up their hopes as lost causes. Ordinary people find themselves alone in life, single, divorced, or having lost a spouse to death. Ordinary folks work at wearisome jobs and have little or no opportunity for advancement. Ordinary people hope for a greater fulfillment, to be remembered. Ordinary people work hard all of their lives and sometimes never seem to get ahead. Ordinary people invest money and their lives in a business only to see it slip away. Ordinary people lose their jobs or their pensions or their plans for their retirement go out the window. Without faith, it is hard to believe that God remembers us in these ordinary circumstances, these ordinary times. It is hard to believe without faith that God has not forgotten us in our weariness. As ordinary people, Mary and Zachariah saw no evidence in their world of God remembering or even God keeping God's promises made so long ago. But at Luke's house, as we are invited into Luke's gospel, into Luke's house, we see instead with eyes of faith and we begin to shape our lives accordingly. Once again, despite all the evidence to the contrary, God has not forgotten us. God has not forgotten God's world. God has not abandoned God's most broken and needy people. So this Advent season, as we once again gaze upon the nativity, we are invited to rest beside the weary road and hear the angels proclaim peace to a broken world. In the middle of the night, God has not forgotten us. It came upon the midnight clear that glorious song. Robin Joe's
In your weariness, in the overwhelming exhaustion that comes with the season, may you remember and not forget that God has not forgotten you. Go in peace in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.